Uh, let me just introduce um, um, the, the main points that I want to make this morning. First, I'm going to give you a short overview of the German and also European notion of privacy, especially from a legal uh, standpoint. So what is, um, what is privacy in data protection? Uh -huh. Just to sum it up uh, quite briefly, so that you have a backdrop um, for the work of the um, role in the functioning of the inquiry committee that the German National Parliament has set up to uh, inquire the uh, wiretapping activities, um, in particular of the National Security Agency. And thirdly, I'd like to introduce you into the effects on the public debate. So how is um, especially NSA, but also the, the spying of German agencies perceived in the public debate back in Germany? So, first of all, privacy in Germany. Interestingly, the debate about um, the profiling powers of information technology uh, came up in the United States. Today, maybe um, Germany or Europe is perceived as the stronghold of privacy um, in the world, but that hasn't always been the case. Just like information technology was mainly developed in the Silicon Valley, as we all know, um, so, such has um, the debate about the, um, the dangers associated with the use of information technology, especially for the free um, expression of one's ideas. That was back in the 1960s, and these, um, these, these ideas were, of course, um, received uh, on the other side of the Atlantic and discussed a lot in Germany, and the main approach was first to look at dangers of, uh, of data, dangers of information technology, but not like to regulate how data was to be handled. It was just about how can data be abused. That was the case in Germany as well, until the early 1980s, when in 1983, the federal government started a project um, to, um, uh, to assess the whole population of the uh, of of Germany, so a census, and many, many activists opposed the idea that everybody be counted. And so people went to the Constitutional Court, which um, in the end of 1983, so just weeks before the year 1984 started, came up with a case which is famous now um, as the Volkszählung or census case. And in this case, the Constitutional Court laid the groundwork for privacy law in Germany and it created a basic right to informational self-determination which sounds complex, but the idea behind it is, I think, appealing to this day, because it basically means that everybody shall have the right to know who knows what about whom. Because the court defined it in a negative way, if you do not know who knows what about you, then all your social interactions are kind of tainted, because you always have to think, well, what does this other person know about me? Um, what kind of profile might this person have already created? Um, so it's, it's just a very limiting force on, your, on all your social interactions and, of course, also on, um, on your political uh, activities. And so the court said, for a democratic society, it's, it's, um, it's crucial that you have some kind of control about which data is gathered about you. And so um, it, the court uh, thought of um, two basic means, to, or one, one, one principle um, that should safeguard this informational safe determination, and that is that every treatment of information, be it gathering information in the first place or treating it, for example, uh, referring it to somebody else or combining it with other um, information pieces, all that needs some kind of authorization. And this authorization can be twofold. Either the data subject, so the person concerned, has to consent with this kind of gathering or treatment of data, or there needs to be some kind of statutory authorization, basically some kind of law that says, well, you as a private company or you, you as a government agency can do such and such um, ways of treating data. So this was kind of a basic right, and it applies both to government bodies directly and um, also to private parties. There are like particularities in, but uh, I don't want to bore you with that. So basically, government bodies and private parties alike are bound by this basic right. They need either consent or a statutory authorization to handle personal data. Of course, all that is a very nice principle that may have been um, realistic in the early 1980s, but that already was threatened by what happens on the internet. Um, I'm, um, I'm hearing that you have been talking extensively about those problems yesterday, uh, because of course when um, Internet companies are gathering a lot of data, um, then you 
don't necessarily have control what happens with your personal information. And the, uh, the main problem here, at least from my point of view, um, is that the consent model is kind of limited uh, in its value for really controlling information because usually you just don't have an alternative. So you're, you're going to give some kind of um, blank check authorization to internet companies to do whatever you, they want to do with your data because they have some, some 50 pages um, of terms that you just have to consent to or you are restricted from using their services, uh, which uh, may not be feasible for social reasons, for example. Being out of Facebook is not exactly easy. I learned that the hard way at Columbia because uh, party invitations usually would just spread via Facebook. I was extremely reluctant to use it, but I finally came to the conclusion that there is no way around it, at least while being in the United States. I'm not sure if this is, this is true elsewhere, but at Columbia that was, that was the case. And there was one student, I remember, a good friend of mine today, um, who was still, um, still hesitant, who would just wouldn't sign up uh, to Facebook. And so I ended up printing out invitations as a PDF file and emailing them to her so she would be in the know what's going on in the class. So um, the principles of informational self-determination were already pretty much threatened by what went on, in, uh, in, on the internet, but at least the basic principle was still standing and the debate was more about how can we rein in the activities of internet companies so that this model that, was origin that, was, uh, that originated in German law but that spread to European law um, might be more like, effective than it used to be. But then came 2013, what I want to call the Snowden shock. So Edward Snowden, of course, leaked a lot of um, documents to journalists first, who then successively published information about these programs. And I want to quote in particular, two revelations from the Snowden Papers. First, the so-called PRISM program, which basically means that um, internet companies based in the United States can be forced to hand over their data to uh, the National Security Agency, and it is still unclear to this day if this handing over is kind of automatic, so that there is kind of a black box that directly um, sucks data out of, um, out of internet companies' systems, or if this is like a manual way of handing over data, at least to my knowledge, this has not been revealed, but still, the baseline is that, um, that government agencies in this country can get whatever is stored on Facebook's or Apple's servers, basically. Well, Apple, for example, claims that they have not been targeted, but they appear on a slide of the Snowden Papers, so this is unclear, but, but the baseline is that um, there is broad access to data stored in the cloud uh, controlled by United States companies. And um, that, of course, was greeted with utter panic by many civil rights activists uh, in Germany, but also around the world, because it is kind of the antithesis, really, to informational self-determination. When whatever you store on a cloud provider servers can be gathered by government, there is just no privacy left, at least in so far as you're using internet services. Second example, um, the tapping of fiber optic cables that was mostly done by the uh, GCHQ, so the um, uh, the British counterpart to the NSA, but um, which, of course, um, by means of the so-called Five Eyes exchange between the services of uh, Britain, Canada, the United States, Australia, and New Zealand can be exchanged between all these countries. So whatever uh, the UK sucks or snoops um, from, uh, from fiber optic cables is all, can also be used by uh, the services of these other countries. And um, so this, of course, um, also sets very strict limits um, on to privacy because um, these, uh, these fiber optic cables carry the internet, internet traffic of the world. So whatever you send unencrypted over a fiber optic cable will at least initially be read by these agencies, at least if the cable that your data is flowing through is tapped, which is of course um, also incompatible with the notion of informational self-determination because these agencies then know whatever you send over these cables. Um, all these revelations at first concerned mostly internet activists and many journalists um, in Germany, for example, but not necessarily the German government. But this changed when another revelation by the German magazine Der Spiegel came up. <coughs> which uh, revealed that even the cell phone of the German chancellor, so uh, Angela Merkel, was apparently uh, wiretapped 
by um, the NSA based uh, in the American Embassy just a few hundred yards from the German Parliament and the seat of the government. So um, and this, of course, call, um, created quite an outcry in Berlin. And this was when Angela Merkel said um, that spying upon partners is something that d may not happen. is a total no-go. So this was the moment when she said um, that kind of the limits are reached and this is something that definitely needs to stop. So at this point also the German parliament tried to, um, to shed a light on what's actually happening because up to this point it was only just Snowden revelation. So selected slides from the vast trove of Snowden documents um, that, um, that got known to the public, and so nobody really knew what was going on. It was just like um, just a little bit of evidence, a little bit of light shed onto um, certain NSA programs and also programs that were executed by the GCHQ and apparently also in cooperation with German agencies, but nobody really had the big picture. And so the German parliament decided in March 2014 to set up an inquiry committee, which is today nicknamed the NSA Inquiry Committee, to really get to know, first of all, um, of course, to which extent do Five Eyes agencies gather communications inside of, originating in, or directed at Germany, but also, what did German authorities know about this, and did they possibly profit from such information gathering, and thirdly, do practices of German authorities need to change in order to comply with the German constitution, but also international human rights law? So this is the, the uh, leading questions that this uh, inquiry committee tries to answer, and that also limit the scope of its investigation, um, which can be felt almost on a daily basis. So what does this inquiry committee do? The German law that uh, regulates the work of inquiry committees is um, modeled after the German Code of Criminal Procedure. So it basically works like it was a criminal court, um, and most part of its work consists in hearing witness statements. Uh, witness statements. So they are inviting people from the executive branch of government usually, who then testify about their work. But of course, most of these witnesses are people that work at um, secret agencies. And this means that most of what they could theoretically testify on is classified information. And this means that the sessions of the inquiry committee usually start with a public part, like at 11 in the morning until 5 in the afternoon, the witnesses testify in, open, in an open session, and then they continue in a closed session. And as far as I learned from, um, from people who are admitted to these closed sessions, who have, um, and with the necessary clearance, very often the, the, the witnesses testify about some, uh, some government program in the open session, and then they kind of contradict themselves in the closed session. So basically, there's a public-facing side of the, uh, of the government agencies, which is kind of whitewashed, and then in the classified session, of course, um, under, um, under oath, kind of, and threatened by prosecution if they testify wrongly, these witnesses tend to correct what they said in public session. But this, this of course, may not be referred directly by those who are admitted to the closed sessions, and so it's really hard for journalists to know what's going on. But let me just um, quote uh, two main findings that this inquiry committee made. Um, although the, uh, its work is relatively difficult due to um, classification of information. So the most, um, probably the most outrageous program that was so far un, um, revealed um, is nicknamed Aikonal, whatever that may mean. It's probably Greek, I guess. Sounds like it. Um, and this program basically means that whole fiber optic cables running through the Frankfurt Internet Exchange, which is the largest internet exchange in the world, the so-called D-Kicks, um, were tapped by the BND, which is kind of the German equivalent to the NSA, but only charged with um, wiretapping and information gathering abroad, theoretically. So this Frankfurt cable was tapped by the BND and then scanned um, with, for search terms interesting to German authorities, but also search terms that the NSA provided to its German partners. So there was kind of a direct cooperation tapping a German cable in Germany by German authorities, but on behalf 
of their American partners. And it appears that Germany was paid for this information by providing software. So the agencies developed some kind of um, tit for tat. They, uh, the, the Americans provided software and knowledge how to effectively wiretap such cables, and in return, data was sent to the US. And in open sessions, the witnesses testified that, of course, um, no data pertaining to German nationals was transferred to the United States in this Iconal program. But in the closed sessions, it appears at least, such as it has been reported in the press, uh, it was made clear that these automatic filters are not as effective as they should be or would need to be in order to really make sure that no data pertaining to German nationals is transferred, which means that the German authorities knowingly um, sent data to the United States that they would never have um, been able to, or at least legally would have been able to, which of course is kind of outrageous and um, spoke a lot of public debate about the legality of such programs. So the baseline of it is, even if this inquiry committee is nicknamed the NSA inquiry committee, um, the, mo the maybe even more problematic findings um, concern the German authorities, because of course the German parliament can't directly change the behavior of what uh, American government agencies do, but at least it can, and in my personal view, it should also make sure that German agencies follow German law, and especially the German constitution, which um, at least as far as we know so far, has not necessarily been the case. So, um, let me come to my third small part, which concerns civil society's reactions to what the inquiry committee has so far revealed. Um, first of all, the press. In the beginning, there has been relatively broad coverage of the Snowden revelations. Even the very first program that came to light, which was the um, Verizon wiretapping program, well, not directly wiretapping, but metadata trans transfer program so that every Verizon phone call was directly transferred to the NSA, was covered extensively in Germany as an example um, for a so far unknown surveillance program. But of course, um, in the more than two years since the first Snowden revelations, um, something that I'd like to, to call the NSA fatigue um, has struck uh, German press so on it, every detail that comes to light is now reported because it's just not such, uh, it's not necessarily so new, you know? The press usually uh, jumps on things that are really, the, really new and um, they have, there are so many surveillance programs that, um, that we have learned about uh, that it's not necessarily interesting to the press anymore, but particularly outrageous findings like the Iconal program are still being uh, reported and commented on pretty extensively. So how about the general public? I find it relatively hard to assess what people in general think about these surveillance programs, um, but my suspicion is that the interest in the general public is quite limited. Um, I think there is some kind of resignation that's taking place, just because um, at first it's mostly American authorities um, that you can't control at all, to be honest, if you're a German citizen. And even the German authorities try to hide their activities from Parliament, as I explained, you know, the difference between the open sessions and the closed shops. Um, so it's just extremely hard already for a member of Parliament to change anything about it. And uh, it's, of course, even more difficult for a simple citizen. And um, if you take the last elections in Germany in the fall of 2013, so just, just a couple of months after the first Snowden revelations, then um, they ended in an almost, almost um, absolute majority for the Conservative Party that had already declared the Snowden scandal over right before the elections. And if the party that says Snowden relations are over and Snowden scandal, we are done with it, um, almost completely wins the elections, and I think this is kind of telling about the importance that the general public in Germany accords to this issue. Um, but of course there are people in society who, think, who see things completely differently, um, especially internet activists, of course, the data privacy activists. Um, and the main thinking in these, um, in these circles is, at least to my knowledge and to my understanding, that politicians have just utterly failed to create sufficient safeguards for privacy and to rein in uh, surveillance agencies. And for this very reason, 
um, we now need technical solutions. And this is what internet activists su suggest doing. So, uh, for example, I don't know if you have heard about it, but the um, American NGO, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, EFF in San Francisco, just launched a program that, um, that seeks to um, assure that every traffic on the internet be encrypted. So they created an, um, kind of an agency that, uh, that gives out HTTPS certificates to everybody, so it now gets free to add s uh, strong encryption to your web server, and there is no more pretext now not to use uh, strong encryption so that every HTTP traffic, so web traffic, shall be encrypted. In general, internet activists um, advocate the use of strong cryptography, not only on the web, but also for sending emails. PGP or GPG is the best known standard for email encryption, which is now relatively straightforward to use. And of course, there's a system called Tor, the onion router, which basically means that you can use the internet um, in an anonymous way, because if you pay attention at least, your data uh, that you want to transfer, transfer over the internet is sent over uh, several steps so, so as to, um, to cover up who is the original sender of that traffic. So this is a, uh, this is a suit, so to say, of uh, encryption and other technical solutions to the surveillance problem. But as a legal scientist, I still have to ask, is this really the last answer? I mean, in a democratic society, shouldn't we come up with some kind of plausible regulation? Shouldn't we, um, shouldn't we just refrain from giving up too early and shouldn't we just discuss what is the right balance between surveillance that we might need, for example, for national security reasons, and the privacy that was up, upheld so highly in the early 80s and that has been on the decline ever since. I think this is really an interesting question that democracy should answer and not only technologists. Thanks so much and I'm looking forward to the debate.